This is Distant Replay, the podcast that goes back in time to relive all the greatest events that we witnessed in sports. From upsets, to championships, to cultural moments, we discuss it all. Coming up on today's episode. Do you think you have a gambling problem at all? No, because I can stop gambling. I have a competition problem. A competitive problem. It didn't affect his endorsements. It didn't affect him monetarily. It didn't really affect his popularity. But the damage was to his reputation. And the price to pay was how tedious this all became for Michael to have to answer these questions. Welcome in to Distant Replay Podcast. I am Ben George alongside Mike Noto. We're talking episode six of the Last Dance documentary. We've already gone through the previous five. Now we move to the second half of this documentary. We start to see Jordan going for the three-peat. Now, really a very interesting part of his career. He's he's risen to the top, to the pinnacle, apex Jordan, as we talked about last episode. And now how does he manage this celebrity, this stardom, this pressure that comes along with being the most well-known athlete in the world? Distant Replay Podcast, you can find us on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe, and distantreplaypodcast.com is the website. Got to get that out of the way, Mike. Let's jump into this episode, episode six. So we kind of see, leading, leaving our last episode, Life is Jordan is going to kind of be a big kind of narrative for this episode, and probably going forward, we see the stardom uh, that he draws to every game that he goes to, how difficult it is for his staff, his PR staff, and opposing venues to kind of deal with it. But really to kind of get a peek behind you know, him just at his hotel room, away from all the circus of the media. You know, there's a lot of pressure. I mean, we, we, we talk about the stardom and dealing with it, but I mean, I don't know that anybody up to that point had, had as much as, as Jordan had in any, really any profession. Yeah, I, I can't think. I mean, because you got to remember now, we're going from beating the Blazers in the finals right to the Olympics, and now we're in that next season where he is just, again, we talked about it last episode. It's Apex Jordan at this point. I mean, he's going from hotel to practice venue, back to his hotel, hotel to game venue, back to his hotel. You know, he's not going around walking around in the streets at this point. Uh, he, he's just getting mobbed everywhere he goes. It was like he was, uh, it was like he was getting uh, ushered into a courtroom when all the uh, press wants to talk to him everywhere he went. <laughs> it was wild. And we got a pretty good look into that when he was in his hotel room kind of talking about uh, what his everyday life is like. And it was, it was honestly, it wasn't relatable to the point where it's like, Hey, I could, I, my life is like that, but it's, it's relatable to like, Hey, look, this guy has issues just like we all do. They're just different issues. Right. Yeah, no, exactly. We, we can't relate to to nearly the stuff <laughs> that he had to go through, but yeah, that, that is, that's a good point uh, there. So we kind of get that to begin with, begin the show. And then we get into maybe the best scene of the show and it's not a play. It's not, the 92 Olympics, it's not a championship, it's not him even making fun of Jerry Krause, although there's some very good moments throughout the series of that. But it's the gambling in the locker room, and this kind of begins the conversation of gambling, and this is a big, big part of this this episode, and really for Jordan's career, especially this time, because you know this is kind of when it was revealed that he likes to gamble, likes to go to the to the, the casinos, likes to get bet on the golf course with a lot of people. He had a lot of off the off the court stuff that we find out about and hear about, during this episode, but we first get the, f- the first taste of just kind of how competitive and how much he wanted to always have money on the line wherever he was and whoever he was around. As he's inside the United Center getting ready for his game, and he's got his, what are they, the Sniff Brothers? Is that what they, we call them? Uh, the Sniff, the Jock yeah, Sniffers? Basically, yeah, basically his security team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, his security team, the Jock Sniffers, as I think somebody calls them at some point in this, this series. But our main man, and we've gone, I've gone and found him after the fact, John Michael Wozniak, okay, the Woz, as you like to call him. This is the greatest scene of the of the whole of the whole show. Is they're throwing quarters up against a wall. You know, whoever gets it the closest wins the pool. When it wins the pot of money, Wozniak hits a, hits a quarter, hits Jordan with the shrug. I mean, it is the most cocky, arrogant move in the face of greatness I've ever seen. And then Jordan says, "You can roll on." And he said, "I'm going to roll this money right into my pocket." He hit him with two a two punch, one two, and I could not believe the shrug. And it has become the instant meme of this series. Uh, this guy is a social media celebrity right now, and it's a shame, you know. Rest in peace. I think he's uh, he's passed on. 
you know, he's passed on recently, right? Wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was January of, of 2020. So just a few months before this aired. So he didn't even really get to take his victory lap because I'm sure he told these stories to his friends and his family and asked plenty of jokes and, and probably even saw Michael, you know, through the years. But he would have been an instant celebrity immediately. So it's unfortunate they couldn't really see this this thing and see how much uh, how much fanfare he received. Yeah, I'm glad he I'm glad his family and friends though get this moment to kind of see him um, sort of cutting it up with Jordan. But you know, you know, you have this documentary that has these classic figures in it: Pat Riley, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Isaiah Thomas, you know, uh, Scottie Pippen, Phil Jackson, and leave it to this security guard to provide the funniest. Again, I'll use the term again, most relatable moment of this documentary so far. You know, just cutting it up with your buddies and one of them wins and beats you in something and he razzes you. And the thing he razzes them with is, is, the, is the Jordan shrug from, uh, you know, the previous year's NBA Finals. So classic because I think getting back to what we were talking about before with Jordan sort of being isolated, these security guys were probably the people that were around him the most if you take the totality of people he was around, right? So yeah. these guys yeah. probably became like his friends and probably socialized with him a lot more than 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 a lot of other people did. Well, yeah, and they protected him, so I'm sure he, you know, he obviously had a lot of trust in these guys. But you don't have that kind of, you're not really, you don't make that kind of move and pull that shrug out on Jordan unless you guys are really comfortable with each other, right? I mean, yeah, like you said, dude, <laughs> he did the he did the double shrug. He shrugged, and then he was like, in case you didn't see it, Jordan, I'm gonna shrug again. The expression on his face too is what this whole look. I mean, the the curly hair, you know, the gun on his on his waist, the baggy pants, the suit. I mean, it was just everything about him was just really, really hysterical. And just to pull that off was just the moment of the series so far. Such an authentic, such an authentic moment. <laughs> oh my god, uh, we'll be talking about that one forever, and uh, I'm sure you'll be sending that picture out in the group text uh, quite a bit every time <laughs> something sure. big happens, right? Uh, so that was that was quite the moment of the series, but it kind of takes us into the whole the whole conversation of Jordan, uh, and what we'll get to in just a second of him gambling. But a couple of things happened before this. First, you know, the drinking beer after the game I thought was kind of an interesting moment that they that they put in there, and it was just really kind of a quick look at you know what's going on kind of behind the scenes. I mean, they could have left that out, and it wouldn't uh, wouldn't have changed this documentary at all. Uh, it did give Miller Light a lot of publicity considering he that was the kind of the beer he turned to but i thought what was more interesting to me was how he how he said in the locker room afterwards you know you beginning of my career this would have been guys finishing a case in the locker room we're drinking at halftime smoking cigarettes and drinking at halftime bumming smokes off their coach bumming heaters off their coach is what he what he said which is crazy <laughs> yeah it is nuts and uh, you know it got me thinking where you know him and pippen are sitting around actually pretty sociable at this point and you kind of see a different side of pippen that I don't think we normally see, which is pretty cool. But, you know, does that go on at all these days, you think? The beers in the locker room? Yeah, like just having a, a beer or two before you leave the I locker room. Do you know. think that even happens or not at all? I just don't know. Probably, yeah. I mean, I would think so. I just don't know how much privacy these guys have in a locker room anymore with True. the media, all the media they have. I mean, there was still media then, but as you saw there, it's kind of a holding room. And I'm sure they have certain areas of the locker room they can get to and, and kind of have some time to themselves. But, yeah, I, they probably, I mean, crack one open every now and then, but... Yeah, to be able to sit there kind of in peace, away from everything, and just kind of share that moment with your teammates. That's a pretty cool little little moment. It looked like Ron Harper's his boy, too. I was just kind of thinking about that. Like, Ron Ron seems to be his boy more and more as these, these episodes progress. We see him on the golf course as well. But overall, it's playing pretty— cards with him, Playing cards with him, playing cards with him on the plane. Yeah, exactly. But again, you money. see Jordan in these one-on-one -on -one situations, like we just discussed with the security guard in a small group, with Pippen and, and uh, Ron Harper, whether it's— having a couple beers or playing cards again, really authentic moments that you saw Jordan, like, wow, I'm, you know, I don't have people bothering me. I can actually just let loose and be normal. You know, I don't have to turn it on right now. I can just be myself. Yep. It was. So it was a pretty cool, pretty cool one, but I, I could just picture him in that like 84, 85 bulls locker room. And like, they just, they just won their eighth game of the season, you know, and it's January or February and, and these guys are cracking open a bunch of beers and celebrating and Jordan's just pissed off. Like I can just I can picture that that team of uh now what would be misfits, it seems like like a ragtag team that they were running out there at the time. But it was pretty funny to see kind of see how that how that used to play out. And I think that was the kind of case across all sports too. I mean we we see we saw football players smoking cigarettes back in the what, sixties and seventies on the sidelines and We've seen baseball players doing it and still do it. I mean, that's one of their big things. So, But to see basketball, because it's such a high-level, high-endurance sport that it's hard to imagine guys pounding beers at halftime. But I guess that's the case. So 
let's transition into uh, the book now. The book was another big part of this, the Jordan Rule, Sam Smith. We've seen him a few times in the series, a, a writer in Chicago, around the team, very close relationship with the team. And, and he, he puts a book out right after that 92 season, kind of documenting how things went. This is when we first kind of hear about Jordan. And I remember when this book came out about how he mistreats his teammates, you know, he's gotten in a fight with his teammates before in practice, you know, stuff that probably happens quite a bit. But this is the first time we hear about it from Jordan, who's like this guy that, you know, his image is pristine. He is the face of so many brands. And we kind of kind of see that, you know, this guy, he's got a human element to him that we're kind of learning about. But when we look back on it, he was just super competitive. That's how he always was. He was always trying to get the best out of his teammates. So I never faulted him for that. But I thought it was interesting that they pinned everything, all the leaks on Horace Grant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, getting to what you just said, though, before we get to Horace Grant, because I found that situation pretty puzzling. But this is the first time where you have everyone like Jordan, you know, you had – the Lakers and Celtics rivalry, you either liked Larry Bird or you liked Magic Johnson. To this point, there was really no reason not to like Michael Jordan, no matter what fan you were a team of. And this was the first thing that sort of, not tarnished his, 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 uh, his reputation, but sort of put to light some, some pretty uh, you know, interesting stories of how he deals with teammates. And I read this book when I was in high school, so not when it got released, but you know, years later, maybe seven, eight, nine years later. And there's a lot of stories in that book that don't paint him in a flattering light that I don't know if they're going to get into or not. And they attribute, they pretty they glossed over this a little bit, that they attribute a lot of the leaks from those stories coming from Horace Grant. It's something Horace Grant denies. They didn't even ask Sam Smith about it in the documentary, and I don't think he'd give up his source anyway, obviously. Mm-hmm. But they seem pretty adamant that Horace Grant was sort of the culprit here, but it wasn't something that was dwelled on a lot. No, it's almost like they got over it. I mean, B.J. Armstrong's, yeah, you know, he was on there and said that uh, you know he thought there had to be multiple people in order to to get that information out there. Couldn't have just been one person that was leaking those stories to to Sam Smith. And he probably you know he probably has a point. There were probably a few guys that were you know you got to imagine some of those teammates probably were pissed at Jordan at some point in their careers, right? I mean everybody probably hated him at some point in practice. Oh yeah. To where if you catch Sam Smith at the right time, you're going to hear a lot. You know, and that's probably what happened in some of these cases. And, and it doesn't seem like there were any hard feelings with Horace, right? I mean that's that's kind of where you thought. Yeah how even they, they show, you know, fast forward years later to 98 and they're meeting at half court and they're joking, having a good time. Yeah. It, for, for how serious it seemed at the time, it didn't seem like Jordan cared too much. I don't know if it was just because they got along well and they just kind of knew that was just the case. And, and Horace, that's maybe that's something Horace did. I don't know. But yeah, I, I agree that it's kind of, kind of hit it and didn't, didn't make Horace look too bad. And we know from this documentary, Jordan doesn't have any problem hiding his feelings about how he feels about people. So yeah. it's not like he's hold, he's holding it back for some reason. And, you know, it, it just, again, it, it, they go into multiple stories in that book. I mean, it's pretty well known. He's punched multiple teammates in the face in practice. <laughs> yeah. Of which Will Purdue definitely is on record of saying it. Steve Kerr is definitely on record of saying it. And Will Purdue pretty much in no uncertain terms said, yeah, he's – He's been physical with me in practice, and I'm not the only one. You know what I mean? So, you know, there was a lot of these issues. You know, it it seemed like, honestly, I don't think the teammates had as big of an issue with it as maybe the outside did. Yeah, I think that's probably fair. And it it goes to this whole idea that, you know, when you get to this level, people start looking for something bad on you. And that was kind of the conversation. And and that's what happens. I mean, you know, Sam Smith said that's, that's kind of who he always was. He wanted to always find the story behind you know, behind the doors, behind the hot locker room doors and kind of get to know who these people are. And I don't fault him for that, but it kind of fits this whole idea that we want to look for some controversy on this guy and, and that's what's going to sell and that's what's going to get attention. And we see that throughout the, the season and, and into the gambling. And, and yeah, of course it's a big deal. And and I don't think it's that into the, up to that point, gambling has been going on forever. I mean, you can go back as far in time as you want and you're going to find somebody gambling with some form of currency on some event or outcome. But Jordan just happened to be the, the highest profile guy and did it at such a level because he had the income. He had the money. I mean, Davis Stern even said, we, we weren't worried about Jordan because we know how much he makes, right? We, you know, it, It's different if you and I, Mike, are dropping 10 grand in Atlantic City on the weekend. That's going to be a problem for our families. But for Jordan, dropping 50 grand, 100 grand, a mil is not a big deal. And it's just people kind of drumming these stories up. And thankfully, you know, for, for our sake and for his sake, he wasn't around now when everything gets multiplied over and over and beaten uh, till it's till it's dead and, and done. But this was the big story then, and this this really all came to a head with the Knicks and Bulls series. And I know you have to remember this one well because you're a big Knicks fan. We've documented that on the podcast. 
and this might have been the last time the Knicks were any good. Uh, sorry, Mike, but it's probably the truth. Uh, but you go back to that series. The Knicks were really good that time, and they had a, a ton of players. They were physical. They got after you. They played defense, and they gave this Bulls team a lot of fits. Got up 2 nothing right, in this Eastern Conference Finals in 93. Looked to be on the doorstep of ending this run by the Bulls, and then Jordan goes to Atlantic City, and that lit the entire fire. Yeah, like you said, backing up a little bit, the Knicks go up 2 nothing in this series. They have the home court advantage in this series. You know, so at this time, I'm about I'm a, uh, 12 years old. So at this time, I'm fully aware of what's going on. I'm so into this series. I'm so into the Knicks. Because um, at this time, all the other teams that I rooted for were not as good as the Knicks. Let's put it that way. <laughs> the Rangers were getting better, but, but, but the Knicks were far and away. You know, and they're the one team that sort of brought all New York City fans together because no one really roots for the Nets. So <laughs> they're up to nothing. Now you have the story come out where Jordan goes to Atlantic City in between games one and two with his father to let off some steam. Uh, I don't think you could compare the, that gambling to the gambling that we would hear come out later where he was basically hanging out with hustlers and, and losing hundreds of thousands of dollars to them. But needless to say, like you said, we build people up to break them down. The media got a hold of this story and really went to town on him and it caused Jordan to cut off talking to the media completely until right before the finals. But the Knicks up to nothing in this series. They go back to Chicago with Jordan now full of fire from all this media attention he's been getting for the gambling. And the Bulls tie the series 2-2, and they go back to Madison Square Garden for Game 5. You know, David Aldridge did a great job of explaining the backstory and why that got so much attention. And, it, you know, it's still a big deal. I mean, you're in between games and you go down to Atlantic City and, and, uh, and go gambling. And the bigger, the bigger issue, though, was is this a problem for Jordan beyond just blowing off steam? Is this, is this a deeper addiction issue, potentially? Because we saw the stories. It was your boy Slim Buhler. Was he, he, he was the guy on the golf course with him. Yeah, Slim Buhler <laughs> and this guy Richard Eskinas. I mean, if you just look, if you just kind of shape these guys up and, and give them a once over, they're obviously hustlers, right? And they saw in Jordan a guy with a lot of money who liked to gamble, and they probably hustled him a little bit. And, that, and that's what Jordan said as much in the documentary. They, hey, look, I started hanging out with some guys I shouldn't hang out with. I wasn't doing anything illegal. You know, once I cut, sort of found out what they were all about, I, I cut ties with them, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I, again, it all comes back to me was with he wasn't doing anything illegal. And, I mean, you see this a lot nowadays where people want to tell people how to spend their time and how to spend their money, and he got caught up in that. Yeah, and I think he was a little embarrassed, and that's why I think he first said it was a loan when they discovered the $57,000 check. He just said it was a loan that he gave to Slim, and, and, and once he was called to trial, uh, and he, he had to be honest, that's when he said, yes, it was a gambling debt that I owed, and you know I didn't want to had to put it out there and, and, and be embarrassed by what I had done, essentially. So that's kind of what happened. But that's all why they cared so much about Atlantic City. They still would have cared, but it was just adding on top of every. This guy had been in the courtroom with this guy, right? Involved in this money laundering case. You know, how deep does he, these issues go? And, uh, you know, when you find out about it, and you hear Jordan, I, I, I'm with you. I kind of completely believe that this is a guy that was just looking for every opportunity to bet. If anybody had a game that he was, that he could get in on, he was probably going to take that up, as he said before, said in this episode when he was on the plane and Purdue and, and Steve Kerr and B.J. Armstrong were playing for a dollar blackjack hands at the front, and he wants to play just because he wants to have your money in his pocket. And I think that's the case here. Same thing. Guys want to play. There's a game open. I'm in. How much is it for? Okay, let's play. And then he kind of figured out, all right, there's some certain elements that are trying to take advantage of me. I can kind of sort this out as I move forward and have plenty of, of income to not worry about. But that was a big part of this, and it just kind of showed you. I mean, when he wanted to turn it on in any, really, any circumstance, he could do that. And he did that in this this series against the Knicks, and you know they they were able to close him out in seven games. And well, I gotta, well, I gotta, Ben, Ben, we gotta back up here. Okay, okay. Two quick things. All right. First of all, he has the line of the documentary when he says, "I don't have a gambling issue. I have a competition issue." That's that's yeah. maybe the line of the documentary right there. <laughs> and I, I think very, again, very relatable to those of us who like to throw some money around gambling a little bit. That's first. But you glossed over game five, okay? So give it to us. I have to go on this little rant here because this is a very game near and dear to my heart for all the wrong reasons. Two to two, we're back at Madison Square Garden. Knicks are down by one in the final seconds. And we have the infamous Charles Smith moment, which, which we got. It's the first time in this documentary where I physically got chills watching it. 
it's the first time in my life I could ever remember when I was watching it live, actually getting emotional while it was happening and afterwards, just being so frustrated that a guy who was, I believe, 6'10", you know, couldn't hit a layup and got a shot block three times. <laughs> and if you look at that, I mean, that was pretty much the Bulls won every game of the series after that. The Knicks are done in six games and the Bulls are on to the finals against the Suns. But that was – that's Ben knows me. I'm a very bitter, cynical sports fan because I've never seen my teams win, so I never expect anything good to happen. The sort of birth and the shaping of me as a sports fan really started with this game. When you have this game and then the next year uh, would be the Chris Webber timeout game, I believe. And yeah. <laughs> this stuff sort of all just comes, uh, you know, now I am the way I am. And a big part of this because because of Charles Smith. So thanks, Charles. Well, in in my defense, I didn't know how big I, I knew this series was big. I didn't realize how big that moment was. There's so many in this series, but I get why that one moment because they said on the documentary might be the greatest defensive series really in NBA history. Unbelievable. And you had the Bulls' three best players doing it too. Yeah. So it was Grant, Pippen, and 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 Jordan. And just the highlights from this series were were bonkers. How physical it was on both sides. That's something these Bulls teams don't get enough credit for is they go up against the Pistons early on, now the Knicks, and they give it right back to these teams in terms of being physical, and they don't back down an inch. I mean, something that these these Bulls teams don't get enough credit for. Yeah, I agree. I think they they, they, they kind of played to really any every different type of, of uh, team they, they went up against. They had to really change their style and, and adjust, and they did that really well uh, in multiple series of Jordan's career. But yeah, this was a big one. And that, that Knicks team, and a lot of people now probably don't realize how good the Knicks used to be because it's been a while, but that Knicks, those Knicks teams in the nineties were tough, man. And, and they, right. They had to run up against Jordan a lot of times. And, and it was a very tough side of the NBA, a tough conference. So they, they were kind of cut out, but that team was really good. I mean, Anthony Mason, Larry Johnson, Starks, I mean, that group was strong. And, uh, and this was a, this was a hell of a series when it happened. Yeah, a lot of overachievers on that Knicks team. Obviously, Ewing being the main star and, and and Riley coaching a completely different style than he did when he was with the Lakers and adapting that way. But the Knicks just never got Ewing that second fiddle that they needed to win a championship. And uh, we could do a whole podcast series on that if you want, but I digress. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry for uh, for, for skipping over that, pal, but I'm, I'm glad you got that off your chest. We'll remember that. <laughs> we'll remember that play for a while. On so, to the Suns. So that was, that was the series that moved them into – the championship with the finals with the Suns, a, a series where you had Charles MVP, very good at the time. I mean, we all know Charles now for his his humor, his antics, and and being a, the face of uh, NBA on TNT. But he was a really really good player at the time. This was really peak peak Barkley with the Suns team. And the cool part of this, and again, we get to see how much Jordan. We know when he hates somebody and when he's really has disdain for someone. It cranks it up a notch, and we see that in this series. We already saw it last episode of Ku Coach. Now we see it again. It manifests itself in the form of Dan Marley. And I don't know. I don't think they really explain it in the, the, this episode. Maybe I missed it. He says Jerry Krause was a big fan of Dan Marley, <laughs> so I wanted to go out there and basically stick it to him. And I don't know. I don't know again what what Krause's love affair with with Marley was. How Jordan found that out? What they haven't talks about it. Did it come up before this series? And he was talking about. You better watch out for that Marley guy. That's a heck of a player. I'd love to have him on our team if we ever could do it. Whatever it was. But again, just shows you when Jordan has a personal vendetta, you got to get out of the way because it's over. I mean, Dan Marley, like, what were they just taught? Where were, it doesn't seem to me like Jerry Krause and Jordan were, you know, were talking it up and, and socializing a lot. Like, how does Jordan even find that out that he likes Dan Marley of all players? I mean, Dan Marley was a good player, but uh, poor Dan Marley, right? I mean, you know, Jordan obviously got the better of him in this series. And, you know, you bring up Barkley because at this time, Barkley won the MVP of this season. And, you know, this might have been sort of a little under the radar, one of the series in this run with the Bulls where the Bulls were almost on the ropes because, I mean, the Suns were up four points in that game six with a chance to go up by six, missed an easy jump shot. And then you had the Bulls come back. Obviously, the re you know, we know the rest. They're down by two and hit a three-pointer. John Paxson uh, wins the series for them. But if they lose that game six, you know, they're back in Phoenix for a game seven. And who knows what happens at that point. So under the radar, one a series in this run that doesn't get a lot of pub or notoriety, but a very, very competitive series. And you want to talk peak Jordan. I mean, you look at Jordan's numbers in this series. And, and Barkley, I think, said it perfectly. And I, and I – 
And I thought this was really a signature moment for me when, when he talks about after this the series, Barkley plays one of his best games and Jordan just plays just just better enough to in order to beat them and knock them off and, and to win the championship. And Barkley said that was the first time in his life that he had realized he was not the best player, basketball player in the world. And I, I have to imagine there's so many guys that, that came to that same realization over Jordan's career that were just humbled that had never really had always kind of done what they wanted to, you know, always been, you know, competed and, and gone against some great players, but always had that confidence that if I ever need to win, I'm the best guy to do it. In this series, that wasn't the case. And you look at what Jordan did every every game. He led scoring, led both teams in scoring every single game except for this game two where he tied Barkley. But he went for 31, 42, 44, 55, 41, and 33 in the NBA Finals. Six games. Unreal. Think about that. I mean, that's that's one of the epic performances. I don't even think we think about Jordan as much in this series. This series kind of goes overlooked when you think about signature moments for Jordan over those six championships. But this may have been his best performance. Yeah, do you think about this this whole documentary? Just I I, I know Jordan said at the beginning of the documentary that people th- that he thought that this documentary would make him look bad to some people, and unless there's some really bad stuff coming in the next four episodes. Um, I think this is making Jordan look great. And I also think for people who have never seen Charles Barkley play, the same is the case. Because we think Charles, a lot of people think of Charles Barkley, the younger people, about you know how he looks now and how he acts now. And he, he gets compared a lot to like Draymond Green and, and all these other players in the NBA. And I think after you watch this episode, you, you sort of remember again, Charles Barkley was an MVP level player. You know, I think this is a documentary that's going to make him sort of people either remember or be introduced to how good of a player he was also. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And, and yeah, I don't know what's going to come. I mean, I I think we'll get more of just kind of who Jordan was off the court and we'll kind of get more into that. And I think that'll probably maybe rub some people the wrong way. But I agree. I mean, I think anybody that's really followed Jordan probably kind of knows a lot of these stories, at least like knows that he wasn't the perfect, the perfect guy. I mean, you know what I mean? It's so like, I don't know what's to come either, but that will be, uh, be interesting to see how that plays out. But that was, I think, a big moment in the series. And, and now we kind of move ahead. As this, as this episode concludes, we, we get to the end of the regular season in 1998, and we're heading into the postseason. And that comes right at the time. It's also in Jordan's career where he will transition away from basketball. So uh, there's a lot still to come in this series. We still have three championships, including that final season, plus Jordan's time away from the game. So there's still a ton to come, but so far it's been awesome. Yeah, and like you said, there's so, much of these top- so many of these topics that they could have gone into more detail on. And it's crazy to think there's still so much more to come. And to be honest, I can't wait for next Sunday and see what's in store next. Yeah, same here. So we'll be back again next week, Monday, day after the episodes air. And we will be back with some reaction, some recap of The Last Dance. But having a lot of fun so far. I know everybody that's followed along has. And shout out to our boy Waz. One of, one of the great moments I've ever witnessed. And uh, I still laugh about it every time I watch him and see that the picture of him with the shrug. Rest in peace, Big Waz. R.I.P. was.